Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on gaining acceptance in next generation PBK modeling approaches for regulatory assessments. This webinar is hosted by the OECD Environment, Health and Safety Division of the Environment Directorate. I am Magda Sahana, and I'm administrator to the Hazard Assessment Program. Before we go further, I would like to emphasize that your active participation is important throughout uh, the session. Next slide, please. During the presentations, we'll be managing the Q&A functionality found in the lower banner of, um, of your screen that sometimes appear when you uh, hover over. So it depends on which uh, version of Zoom you have your device, uh, you'll find there this uh, Q&A functionality. You can enter your questions and comments in this uh, Q&A uh, box during and uh, after or after the presentations. We will provide the answers during the two Q&A sessions that we've scheduled towards the end of uh, the webinar. As you have seen, this webinar is recorded and will be made available soon on our webpage. Next slide, please. Today's webinar is, uh, as I've said, on gaining acceptance in the in next generation PBK modeling approaches for regulatory assessments. And uh, the motivation was the OECD guidance document on the characterization, validation, and reporting of PBK models for regulatory purposes that we published in February 2021. This guidance document is aiming to increase the confidence in the use of PBK models parameterized with data derived from in vitro and in silico methods. And aims to help address unfamiliar uncertainties associated with these uh, methods. It's worth mentioning here that this guidance was an international effort and many more experts than the ones that you'll see today contributed with the drafting, reviewing, and development of case studies. And we'll hopefully have the opportunity to hear from the rest of the experts in a future webinar. So we developed this guidance and today's webinar having in mind uh, the community of PBK model developers, also the proponents of PBK models in a regulatory submission and the regulators for who need to assess the applicability of the models in chemicals evaluation. Next slide, please. As you can see, we have a very busy agenda so Cecilia Tan from uh, the US Environmental Protection Agency uh, will start by introducing the guidance document on PBK models. Then Ian Gardner from Certara will talk about parameterization of PBK models using in vitro and in silico data. After this, we'll hear about sensitivity analysis, the theory and the PBK applications from Marina Evans from the US Environmental Protection Agency, and uh, George Loizo from the UK Health and Safety Executive will present an example workflow. Following that, the decision tree for data poor chemicals and the read across approach will be presented by Alicia Paini from the European Commission Joint Research Center. From the same organization, we have Andrew Worth who will introduce the evaluation framework. And we'll close this first session with uh, Cecilia Tan, who will present the reporting template and evaluation checklist before moving to our first Q&A session moderated by Andrew Worth. Finally, we'll hear about the case studies that were developed by Alicia Paini, and we'll close today's webinar with our second Q&A session. And with that, I would like to hand it over to Cecilia, who will present the introduction 
to the PBK guidance. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Cecilia Tan. I'm a senior scientist at the Office of Pesticide Programs at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. It is a great privilege for us to present to you today the new OECD guidance on PBK modeling today. Uh, next, please. In the next few minutes, I will give you an overview of the purpose and scope of this guidance document and briefly introduce the concept of PBK modeling, compare this guidance documents with other related guidance, and present the specific aims and contents of this guidance document, and then end with a PBK modeling workflow, which will be referred to throughout this webinar. Next, please. Purpose and scope, next. The motivation of developing this OECD uh, document is to provide guidance on characterizing, reporting, and evaluating PBK models for regulatory purpose. And in this document, we'll try to address some of the key challenges associated with developing PBK models and also evaluating them without the use of any in vivo data. The ultimate goal is to promote the use of PBK models in regulatory risk assessment and to facilitate the dialogues between model developers and users. Next, please. Here are the scope of this, docu uh, this guidance document. Um, this guidance covers contextual information of the scientific process of PBK uh, model characterization and validation but it is not a technical um, manual for how to develop a model or how to um, apply a model. And it is not for assigning confidence levels to different models because the level of confidence required for a model should depend on the context of use and it should depend on the users. And this guidance document is applicable to most chemicals and species as long as there are methods or data available for parameterizing a model. Finally, this guidance is a living document and we expect it to be updated when we have more experiences and when new technologies and applications emerge. Next, please. So here's a brief introduction to PBK modeling approach. A PBK model is a mathematical representation of the kinetic process in the body, including absorption of the chemical into the body, distribution to different tissue and organs, metabolized to a different moiety, and excretion from the body. A PBK model tracks the amount of concentration in, through, and out of the body, given the physiology of the species you're simulating. And also it depends on the physical chemical properties of the chemical. Most of you have probably heard of this quote at the bottom here, all models are wrong and some are useful. No model is perfect. No, no model is a perfect representation of the si system we're simulating. And this concept of a model being useful is particularly important for the type of models that we are talking about today which are developed without the use of any in vivo data. Next, please. So why PBK modeling? A PBK model can be useful to make predictions in conditions where no data are available. So it can be used for extrapolation. It can also be used to organize data, present the current state of knowledge, identify any data caps, and suggest targeted experiments. It can also be used to quantify uncertainty and variability in physiology and in kinetics. And for the type of models covered in this guidance, many of them are developed to, to relate some in vitro bioactive concentration um, to an equivalent external dose for comparison to human exposures. Next, please. Okay. Um, so 
Comparison with other guidance. Uh, next. There are several existing PBK modeling guidance from WHO, European Food and Safety Authority, and also US Environmental Protection Agency. These existing guidance all rely on in vivo animal data to calibrate a model or to evaluate the predictive ability of a model. So for this new OECD guidance, um, the, the, the focus is different. Um, it's PVK models developed and evaluated without the use of any in vivo studies. Next. And you'll hear later um, about the, um, the guidance that we have includes a reporting template. This reporting template is very similar to the ones published by the European Medicine Agency and then also US Food and Drug Administration. The purpose of a reporting template is to standardize the content and format of a model that is being reported um, to um, some regulatory agency. And then the purpose is to facilitate the reviewer's um, assessment um, to have more consistent applications so that more timely decision can be made, made during regulatory review. Next, please. So the contents of the OECD guidance. So there are five specific aims. Um, the first one is to provide a modeling workflow uh, for characterizing and validating PBK models and uh, focus on those without the use of in vivo data. And to provide a knowledge source on in vitro and in silico methods that can be used to generate these model parameters and to provide a model assessment framework to evaluate model performance and a reporting template, as I mentioned earlier, and a checklist for model evaluation. Next, please. There are three chapters in this OECD guidance. The first chapter covers what I just presented. Um, the scope, the introduction, and some background information. The second chapter is the PBK modeling workflow and in vitro in silico methods to um, parameterize a model. The last chapter has the model assessment framework, the reporting template, and then also the checklist that I mentioned. And there are several useful references and case studies in the annex. Next, please. So here is the PBK modeling workflow, next. Um, most of you are probably very familiar. It starts with problem formulation in step one. The second step determines the model structure and the uh, mathematical equations. The third step is to use in vitro or in silico methods to generate model parameters. And this is one of the two key differences between this OECD guidance and other existing documents. So no use of any in vivo data. Step four is using computer program to solve the ordinary differential equations in the model. Step five, um, the equations of the model performance um, is Another key difference of this new OECD guidance, because no, because in vivo data are not available to evaluate a model performance in this case. And the last step is model reporting and dissemination. Um, so that concludes the first part of this uh, webinar. So next, um, I'm going to hand it over to Ian Gartner from Syngenta to cover step three. Um, in the Molly workflow. Thank you. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on, on where you are in the world. So in, in this part of the presentation, um, I'd like to talk about the parameterization of PBPK models using in vitro and in silico data. And I'm making this presentation on behalf of um, all of the people that contributed to uh, putting this guidance together and discussing the different parameters that we had available. Next slide, please. 
So just to recap, so with this guidance, what we really wanted to do was focus mainly on PBPK models that were uh, parameterized with in vitro or in silico input data. And we were thinking particularly about scenarios where there'd be little or no in vivo data for model verification. And so what we're doing here is talking about bottom-up PPK models, so rather than top-down or, or fitting approaches. So taking the different elements we need to build the model, uh, measuring them in vitro and silico and building the model up. Um, in the guidance, we tried to provide a, a model assessment framework to facilitate dialogue between the model developer and regulators. And again, particularly thinking about data poor situations and also addressing uncertainties that would underlie the different model inputs, the structure and the predictions. Uh, we also provided guidance on uh, reporting of PBK models um, in the regulatory assessment of chemicals. And so to facilitate that, there's both a template and a checklist. Um, and we'll go through those as we go through the rest of the presentation. Um, within the guidance, we also considered what we need to take into account if we want to use human in vitro test systems uh, to characterize the pharmacological or toxicological hazard of the chemicals in question. And just to reiterate the point that Cecilia made, this is not a technical guidance, but um, because we felt that's covered elsewhere. So next slide, please. So um, as Cecilia mentioned, we've put together a workflow and most of what um, I want to talk about in this part of the presentation will focus on step three, which is model parameterization. Um, but before we get to that, I've got one slide uh, on model conceptualization. And obviously what we need to think about is that the chemical of, of interest and the mechanisms that we define in the first step will influence both the model structure and the in silico in vitro input data that we need. Next slide, please. So just in terms of uh, model conceptualization, so what's the structure of the PPK model we're going to use and the mathematical representation? It depends entirely on the problem formulation. So what are the underlying biokinetic mechanisms? What do we know about the physiology of the species we're interested in modeling? What data do we have uh, to use for model building? And obviously also will be informed by the route of exposure. So we have different considerations for oral versus dermal versus inhalation, et cetera. And when we take all of that into account and formulate the problem, then we end up with a, a model that we've uh, conceptualized in terms of the structure and mathematical representation. And what we need to think about is the complexity of the model um, and whether it's appropriate for the question we're trying to address. So depending on what we're trying to do, the number of compartments we're using, whether we're using a minimal model or a whole uh, body model uh, would need to be taken into account. For instance, things like whether we're looking at diffusion limited tissues or permeability limited tissues, again, depending on the chemical, there'll be different considerations there. Um, the detail for each compartment in terms of whether we're considering metabolism and active transport also needs to be figured in uh, into this step. And whether we're going to model the parent or a metabolite or both, obviously also uh, we need to decide um, early on in the process. As well, when we're trying to put the models together, we need to account for or try and reduce the mechanistic difference between the in vitro system we're using to generate input data and what's happening in vivo. So next slide, please. So if we think about model parameterization, there's really two aspects to this. The first aspect is to think about the anatomical and physiological parameters that we need. And again, this will vary from species to species. Um, for instance, we need information about the tissue volumes, the blood flow, how tissues connect together. And if we're using in vitro, in vivo, extrapolation approaches, the different scaling factors that we need uh, to take the in vitro data and turn it into the in vivo clearance or whatever that we can use within the PPK model. As part of the guidance, we've listed a number of literature and online resources for physiological and anatomical data um, that we think would, would uh, be useful resource for PPK models, modelers. Next slide, please. 
When we think about the chemical specific parameters, so here we're looking at, for instance, things like the physicochemical properties, um, measurements or predictions of protein and blood binding. Again, we need to think about absorption, the route of exposure and what, what we want to consider in the model. So again, different considerations for oral, dermal and inhalation routes. We need to think about how we're going to describe the distribution of the compound into the tissue. So whether we're using, for instance, KPs or we're using permeability limited tissue models. And if we're looking at metabolic rates or transport, whether we're using intrinsic clearance values or KM and Vmax or KM and Jmax values, it will show uh, saturation with um, increasing doses. And lastly, uh, we need to think about the elimination of the compound in terms of characterizing the renal and biliary elimination. And so what we did in the guidance was for each of these different parameters, provide background information and also specific guidance and things to consider when each of these uh, parameters is being uh, gathered and used in the PBK model. Next slide, please. Because mainly we're interested in uh, parameterizing the PBK models with either um, in vitro data or in silico data, uh, we also spent a bit of time in the guidance talking about the principles for generating the data. And I think it's important to point out that this isn't intended to be an exhausting list of every model um, ever published and used. So if your favorite model is not there, we, we apologize for that. But due to space limitations, we couldn't list everything. Um, there are several different documents um, available talking about reproducibility and reliability of in vitro data. And so those are referenced in the guidance. And obviously, if we're looking at in silico QSAR type models, then OECD has already defined five principles for validating these types of models. Uh, and so again, we refer to this in, in the uh, PBK guidance document. Obviously, even if you follow um, these principles, it doesn't mean you're always going to end up with a suitable QSAR model that's going to give you um, exactly the input data that you need. But regardless of that, we feel that these um, uh, principles are really uh, useful for validating the QSAR model. As well, with each of the different um, types of data that we can use to parameterize the PPK model, we talk about the pros and cons for the different methods. Uh, where we could, we also talked about residual uncertainty and different approaches to try and characterize the residual uncertainty. Um, we also thought about uh, in the report that which details of the in silico and in vitro uh, model parameters you need to provide. Uh, and we feel that how they were calculated or measured should, should be an important element of the PPK report. Within the guidance, we also uh, thought about using in vitro pharmacology, toxicology data for risk assessment and the considerations you need there. So in particular, around the measurement and stability of the chemical in an in vitro system. And also there's a fair amount of discussion of different approaches for biokinetic modeling so that we can start to really relate nominal applied concentrations to the free or intracellular concentration of the chemicals of interest. Next slide, please. So this is uh, just a, an example. So this is when looking at uh, clearance parameters. And as I said, for each of the different parameters, there are, diff there are pointers for the modeler and the assessor. And we hope that this will be a useful re resource both for troubleshooting and, and for points to be considered in the model review. So I'm not going to go through this in any more detail, but just to say that for each of the different parameters that we consider that you need for a PPK model, then uh, we provide this kind of information. Next slide, please. Uh, one slide on uh, computer implementation before I wrap up. Obviously, there are many different packages available for PPK modeling. And in Annex 1, we list a lot of the commonly used uh, software. We recognize that actually, as we think about the model structures, often we need to use solvers that can handle stiff differential equations. Um, but we also considered that the numerical methods are, are reasonably well established. Uh, 
And if used correctly, we don't consider that they're going to represent a significant source of uncertainty in the modeling process. And so in the guidance, we didn't address that aspect any further. Uh, next slide, please. So just in conclusions, what we've done with the OECD guidance was try to provide background information and resources that will be useful for construction of uh, PPK models, particularly where the input parameters are coming primarily from in vitro or in silico sources. So thinking more of a bottom up than a top down fitting type approach. In the guidance, we discuss the reliability of the different approaches for model parameterization and also the principles that we need to follow to get quality in vitro and in silico uh, parameters. And we highlight that through the guidance. And as I've said, we have quite a few different literature and online resources listed uh, that we think will be a useful resource for, for PPK modelers and reviewers. And so next slide, please. So I think that's the end of the presentation that I was going to make. So I now hand on to Marina, who's going to talk about uh, some of the sensitivity analysis uh, within the guidance. Hello and welcome to everyone. Um, greetings from the United States. My name is Marina Evans and I am interested in sensitivity analysis, particularly local sensitivity analysis and its applications to PBK modeling. Um, I am a biomedical engineer at the US Environmental Protection Agency in the United States. And you feel free to contact me should you have any, any desire to do so. Next slide, please. Sensitivity analysis is a technique that allows us to uh, quantify the change in model output for a given change in model input. So here I've attempted to show graphically what this means. Uh, these are simulation results for uh, liver concentration changes uh, after an inhalation exposure. And what I have done with the different uh, lines in the graphs is to change one of the metabolic parameters by 10% both increase and decrease. And you can see different curves related to those changes. Around two hours, uh, the sensitivity coefficient reflects uh, a given particular change that is smaller actually than at six hours. And that is reflected by the magnitude of the sensitivity coefficient, which is larger at that point. Now, I, I will note that the sensitivity coefficients are negative, and that's indicative that uh, as I increase this, as this parameter, uh, the liver concentration will decrease. It's like having a negative slope. Next slide, please. Here I've represented a, a, a one-time uh, sensitivity analysis where I have calculated the sensitivity coefficients for fixed time. And this is a model for dioxin that includes uh, some biological complexity like age binding um, and uh, induction of the enzyme, which is the effect. All the parameters are listed to the right. Uh, I simply wanted to indicate that uh, we can use uh, percent changes and uh, calculate the sensitivity coefficients, normalize them. And this is an approximation uh, approach that is commonly used for uh, PBK, PBK modeling. Um, in the background, I have uh, white bars representing the calculations for default parameters. And I changed the parameters to see uh, how that would impact the analysis. But this bar approach is very useful for uh, ranking the impact of different parameters in the model. Next slide, please. Now, um, I will indicate that sensitivity coefficients or the magnitude of sensitivity coefficients is related to our ability to estimate uh, the parameters uniquely. That is to have one particular answer that is valid. And here's a graphical representation of the major theorem that allows us to do that. Uh, I've, I've graphically shown two metabolic parameters that are correlated. And the reason we say that is because uh, one of the parameters shown in, or the sensitivity shown in green uh, and the sensitivity shown in blue basically add to zero. 
when that happens, we cannot get independent estimates for the two parameters. Next slide, please. Uh, here I'm actually showing or giving an example of, uh, from my work that uh, looks at optimization. How do we get parameter estimates from, from the data that we use? And it is a combination of experimental data and PBK modeling. Um, and this is performed uh, with algorithms that look at regression and the difference between, at each time point, the difference between the experimental data and the simulation. Uh, when the, this difference becomes the smallest possible value, the algorithm stops and gives us the answer for the parameters that we're looking for. Next slide, please. Now, sometimes these optimization process can be a little bit complex or complicated. And I've shown here a graphical example of a surface that has multiple peaks and valleys. And the, um, in this case, the algorithm can actually predict or get stuck, as we say, on the wrong valley and uh, give us an answer that is not optimal. It should have uh, found the global, global minimum instead, which would give a better answer. Next slide, please. This is actually an optimization surface from the experimental data set that you saw in the uh, two slides before. And as you can see, it's riddled with peaks and valleys. And uh, that makes it very difficult to estimate the parameters that we're interested in. Uh, and I should also point out that there are special algorithms that deal with this problem. Uh, in this case, the estimates that we want, we believe are represented by the red dot at the bottom. And that is an area that is full of peaks and valleys, making this very difficult. Uh, and it also re represents low values. Um, and I like to think that sensitivity analysis can help us gain confidence with that estimate. Next slide, please. So in, in this graph, I've, I'm shown uh, an analysis of uh, calculations for sensitive, normalized sensitivity coefficients for the previous experiments at different concentrations. And we have the, the, slow, the lowest one uh, to the highest one used. At 100 ppm, the normalized coefficients show um, correlation. Uh, if I could zoom in into, in the first part of the graph, you would see that it looks a lot like the uh, graph I showed previously with uh, where the parameters actually cancel each other. As we increase, the experimental concentration, one of the parameters seems to separate out the one in blue, which happens to be the maximum uh, metabolic rate. And the other parameter, the affinity constant, seems to uh, be around zero still. But that's good. As we increase the concentration, we can really estimate one of the parameters we're after. Increasing the concentration further, uh, doesn't give us an advantage in terms of sensitivity, it delays the peak. Uh, it takes longer to find that peak. So really, in terms of experiments, we gain a lot of information with just the two, uh, the two initial concentrations, 100 and 500. Next slide, please. So uh, we performed a series of simulations where we estimated the uh, normalized sensitivity coefficients and change the experimental exposures uh, for both parameters of interest. And in blue uh, are shown the uh, progression or the increase and then decrease of the sensitivity coefficients for the metabolic rate. And in green, we are showing the sensitivity coefficients for the affinity constant. And as you can see, the magnitude of the sensitivity coefficients for the max are much larger than the magnitude of sensitivity coefficients for KM. And that immediately implies that the, uh, the, the estimates for P max are easier to obtain from these experiments and, and uniquely identifiable. 
as we perform the simulations, we found that there is a maximum or optimal concentration of around 1300 for Big Max and around 200 for KM. We didn't actually have the 200 uh, ppm experiment. So what we decided to do was to use the higher concentrations to fix the value of Big Max and then use the lower concentrations to obtain the slope of Vmax over Km. And then once we knew that, we could solve for Km and get unique estimates. Next slide, please. I'd like to summarize uh, by saying that the calculation of sensitivity coefficients can be performed either with percent change uh, as an approximation or more analytical approaches as using the chain rule that I've shown some slides for. And it's important to remember that these calculations can vary with time. And they suggest uh, a, a, ma a maximum range where the experiments can be performed to obtain unique estimates. Uh, the largest uh, values really represent the best opportunity to estimate these parameters. And one of the most important applications of this analysis is to rank uh, the parameters in the model to uh, tell us which ones are the most important and where we should concentrate our efforts. And the theorem, again, the summarize of the theorem that is, if the parameters do not cancel each other, then we get unique estimates. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I would like to introduce our next speaker, George Lassou, who is going to talk about a little more about sensitivity analysis. Thank you. Hello. This is George Luizu uh, from the Health and Safety Executive. Um, the Health and Safety Executive in the UK has a mandate to uh, look after the health and safety of working people. Uh, so the focus uh, is on occupational toxicology. Um, I'm going to show you um, how sensitivity analysis can be done in a particular piece of software that we have developed, which has the aim of shifting the emphasis away from maths and programming to the biology behind um, chemical safety assessments. Next slide, please. So um, Marina has... Uh, giving you an overview, um, but I felt that these uh, graphs would be quite informative to uh, confirm that when we're talking about variability and uncertainty, uh, we're talking about parameters that are in the model, such as body weight, uh, mass of the liver, mass of the kidney, blood flow rates through the organs and uh, tissues, and chemical specific parameters around which you have a level of uncertainty, um, and that's represented uh, by distributions, as you see in the top panel A. Um, now, these differing distributions and uncertainties translate into a uh, confidence uh, level around a simulation. So you have in uh, panel B <clears throat> a blue line, and you, it's bounded by um, a region of uncertainty or we would say a confidence level and we would like to know what contributes to this uncertainty and this variability and that's what sensitivity analysis is about next slide please so um this sensitivity analysis i'm going to talk about is called global sensitivity analysis which um is appropriate for uh, biological models that have non-linear processes, things like enzyme saturation and binding to receptors and transporters. Um, and depending on the range of exposures you might be exposed to, you might well um, expose the system to uh, positions where you get nonlinear behavior. Um, and global sensitivity analysis is designed to cope with that. So with PPPK models, we often have a very large number of parameters, typically 50 to 60 parameters initially. So we wish to find a way of 
initially screening the model and focusing on hopefully the smaller number of parameters that determine how variable a given output that you're interested in is. So for example, if you're interested in the concentrations of a substance in the blood, what causes the variability in that concentration in the blood? Which parameters determine that? So we want a way of screening and we have a test we call the Morris test, which allows us to do that so that we can then select the fewer parameters, which we will then um, put through a much more computationally intensive um, analysis, which we call the extended Fourier amplitude sensitivity test. Next slide, please. So the initial screening is for the entire model output. And we rank those parameters um, using a couple of outputs, which I will not describe uh, as much now because it's not really necessary, uh, except that just to say that um, mu is a parameter which gives you an idea of the overall influence that any given parameter has on your model output. And sigma, it gives you an idea of how that parameter might interact with the other parameters um, or how um, it might reflect the nonlinear behavior of your model. Next slide, please. Here's a simulation uh, from the piece of software where you can see uh, the user selecting parameters by clicking the boxes. And these are partition coefficients. Those are measures of solubility of your chemical and your biological media, uh, organ and tissue masses and volumes, Vmax for metabolism, blood flow rates. And you can select the appropriate distribution around that parameter. You have a number of choices there, normal, log normal, um, and you'll see examples of what a uniform distribution looks like uh, compared to a normal. And then you can select Morris testing software, which uh, allows you to generate an array of parameters, which is then uh, analyzed. Um, and the simulation now has just finished an analysis and it should now display the sensitivities of your parameter. And you can then use um, the effects module to look at how these parameters uh, increase in sensitivity uh, with time throughout the simulation. And you can see the parameters begin to separate into clusters and the upper, the, the larger values um, are the most sensitive parameters. And we might be able to pick the top 10 from this list, which will then uh, undergo a more detailed uh, EFAST analysis. Next slide, please. So um, here we choose the time frame over which we wish to select and rank the parameters. So um, you can see these lines give you an idea where most of the sensitivity occurs and for how long. Next slide, please. And then the software allows you to pick the top parameters and we have a means of scoring which parameters are the most consistently uh, sensitive. Um, we've got a, a, a procedure which ascribes a number uh, which allows us to, to rank the parameters. And in this case, you can see MPYLI, for example, is microsomal protein yield in the liver. Uh, VLIC is the mass of the liver. KA is um, a rate constant for uptake. QLIC is blood flow rate through the liver. So these are the parameters and they've been ranked. And the tick suggests that we wish to transfer these parameters to a more detailed sensitivity analysis. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> with the more detailed global sensitivity analysis, there are two effects, two main effects, the main effect of the parameter and the total effect of the parameter. The total effect is the sum of the main effects and how that parameter interacts with all the other parameters in your model. Next slide, please. So this is again an output from our software and you see this output spaghetti 
uh, graph. These are how the parameters change with time through your simulation. And what we do is we take a slice of time, which you can see these lines uh, slicing the uh, parameter sensitivity lines and taking that time uh, parameter and expressing it as a proportion of total uh, sensitivity. So it should add up to one. Um, and then we uh, express this data in what we call the Lowry plot, which we believe is a much more intuitive way of understanding the sensitivity of parameters. And you can see here, the green bar is the main effect of your parameter. And the gold bar on top of that is the interactions that that parameter has with all the other parameters you can see listed here. The plume of smoke that arises from the first um, parameter is the lower bound of the main effects and the upper bound of this plume of smoke is the cumulative total of the green and the brown um, parameters. And you can see that the y-axis set to one, which means if you're interested in accounting for 100% of variability in your model, then you draw a line from one into the cloud and then draw a line down to the x-axis and all the parameters to the left account for 100% of sensitivity. Um, and you saw that there was an animation going on there, which allowed us to look at which parameters remain dominant throughout the simulation. It could be a simulation for 20 hours. You'd like to know where most of the uh, sensitivity is occurring. And it often is in the first few hours. Next slide, please. And there I end and I hand over to uh, my colleague, Alicia Paini. Thank you. Thank you, George. So the, now we are going to present a workflow to use in identification of analogs when you have data poor chemical um, using the read across approach. Next slide, please. We are still in the step five of the workflow that we have uh, been going through uh, this morning. And uh, we are trying still to establish predictive capacity so, uh, um, of the model. So um, traditionally, we know that the model parameterization, calibration, and validation relied really on simulation from in vivo data. However, now uh, we are uh, uh, facing a change and we are developing models using uh, for models for data poor chemicals, which are relying more on the in vitro and in silicon methods as we were hearing uh, uh, from Ian. And, uh, um, or we could use suitable analogs to get information to fill gaps. Um, for, and for this chemical that are poor, we don't have, of course, the in vivo data to evaluate your model prediction against. So we need other line of evidence. Uh, we have heard now Marina and George that just presented the essential part of having a good and robust sensitivity analysis, which could inform your, your model evaluation. But we need also uh, different, uh, um, also other approaches. Um, so next slide, please, with this. I would like to introduce the read across technique, which probably all of you are aware of. It's usually used to predict endpoint information for one substance, the target substance, by using data for the same, for the same endpoint from another substance that we refer as the source substance. So the source substance is our rich uh, um, data chemical that informs for the poor uh, substance that is the, our target chemical. How would this hold for our specific use for the PBK modeling? So for example, uh, if a valid PBK model already exists for a class of chemicals, so for instance, for B, C, D, and E, for an, an, a number of chemicals within the same class, so we, and these are data-rich chemicals, we could use this information to, in, to make model predictions for chemical A, which actually lacks the in vivo data. Um, however, uh, we can alternately uh, parameterize a generic PBK model for our chemical A, so our data poor chemical, and compare our model predictions uh, versus the in vivo information that you have used to validate the, the, the PBK uh, models of chemical B, C, D, and E. Um, 
In order uh, to guide and use uh, the user uh, to this approach, uh, in the guidance document, we have generated a workflow uh, in order to justify the choice of your analog. In addition to this, in the appendix, we have listed a few resources that users can use uh, to identify physical chemical properties, and parameterization, uh, softwares uh, that can be used in PBK modeling, and uh, uh, other simulation tools that can be used to parameterize your model. Uh, next slide, please. And these sources can inform your workflow. So the workflow is based on four steps. We have step one, where we identify, we try to identify the analogs. We should characterize first our uh, um, target chemical. So we need to understand the properties of the target chemical. And then uh, in relation to the properties and all the relative information, uh, we characterize also the analogs. So we can identify potential analogs uh, using appropriate similarity metrics. These analogs uh, should have some prerequisite as well. So you need to search for information on biological basis, on biokinetic parameters, and a PB, if there is already a PBK model uh, code available, if the code is already been uh, evaluated and uh, we can call it a valid PBK model. And there can be some additional considerations um, like a phenotype or other information. We, once you have collected all this information and you have a list of analogs that can be used uh, versus your target chemical, you can go in step two. And is where you select and justify which analog to use. If you have one, that's great. If you have more, it's even better. You can uh, uh, cross-check uh, uh, your uh, identified analog uh, by, uh, um, so you, you shortlisted and you can score them. Once you have, uh, when, once you have shortlisted uh, the chemicals, you can then use the two criteria defined in the workflow uh, on the box in orange on the left. Uh, and these are informed by the prerequisite information. So you need to have information on the biological basis and also if possible, the PBK model already developed. Once you have uh, uh, um, screen out and, uh, and uh, using this inclusion and exclusion criteria, you can then go and select your analogs and use in uh, for your uh, uh, informative way, either as using the PBK model, either as using the, um, sorry, by using the information that you have retrieved. And you can use the information uh, from the biokinetic data. Um, and, then at the end, once you have uh, analyzed and uh, able to make your model prediction, you can use chap uh, the reporting template, which is in chapter three and will be presented later in order to be transparent in the way that you have identified all your data. Uh, in uh, the, um, this uh, uh, workflow uh, is also um, uh, was uh, developed during the OECD uh, uh, um, work by the OECD working group, uh, and we also developed two case study: case study four and case study ten. And next slide, please. I would like now to uh, give you an example uh, from case study four. Uh, before this, I would like to uh, thank Professor Ivona Richens at the Wageningen University because uh, all the work done on the alkaline benzene, which we will present it now, and the PBK model was actually uh, uh, was inspiring that they have developed, inspired this example. And also Professor Judith Madden from Liverpool John Moore University that helped in assessing the coring system and also gave feedback and helped in uh, uh, developing the workflow that we, I've just presented to you. So just going to the case study now, I wanted to uh, uh, show you how we have used the workflow with this specific selected example. So we started by taking uh, an alkaline benzene for which we didn't have any information. When we showed this case study to our working group, uh, we had the feedback that actually it would have been better to take a chemical for which we had data and for which a valid PBK model was already developed. So we had to uh, use, methyl we actually then decided to use methyl leuchinol for this example. And we uh, run uh, using P uh, methyl, le methyl leuchinol as a target uh, uh, chemical. Uh, and we uh, selected uh, and we were able to find nine alkaline benzene with similarities. 
and they're listed in this table. From this, uh, we uh, and this you are now in step one. From from this selection, we went to step two, where we actually used the Tanimoto similarity score and the Liverpool uh, average similarity score in order to refine and shortlist the chemicals to be selected. And this ended up to have five chemicals, eugenol, elimicin, estragol, safrol, and milsticin. From these five, when we looked into the literature for the prerequisite information, we found the information only for two, so estragol and safrol. For, for, from these two chemicals, uh, we then uh, applied uh, the principles that we just, uh, uh, and the way that I just presented to you before, and we were able to make the runs uh, using the estragol and the safrol model using the information from methyl leucanol. We then, uh, uh, as you can see in the graph on the right, we then made the simulations, and we were able to see that uh, uh, the in vivo uh, uh, um, methyl leucanol data and the original PBK model developed for methyl leucanol showed very similar prediction to the estragol model, while there was a, a higher difference when using safrol model. If you want to know more a bit about the scientific approach behind this example, you can go to the uh, paper, scientific paper that we have published, or you can also uh, check uh, the annex uh, to see how we have evaluated uh, at the end the model performance. And this will also be presented at the end of the session today in the case study uh, part. Next slide, please. Uh, with this, uh, uh, um, we are now at the final step of the of this, uh, work of the workflow, and we. It's very important when you develop your uh, PBK models and when you uh, um, inform that the, the model is reported in a transparent way. And if you and also according to the audience you are targeting, you need to disseminate in the proper manner. Uh, we are now exiting the workflow of chapter two of the guidance document, and we are entering chapter three on evaluation framework, which will be introduced by my colleague Andrew Worth. Andrew, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Alicia. Um, yes, I'm Andrew Worth from the European Commission's Joint Research Centre, and it's a pleasure to see such an interest in uh, this webinar today. We currently have over 340 attendees. So as Alicia mentioned, uh, I'm now going to talk about the evaluation framework that's applied um, to the PPK models. Um, next slide, please. So, the guidance document talks about the characterization and validation. It's quite a heavy title. When we talk about characterization, these are the characteristics we're talking about. So you can see that there's a set of characteristics that are linked to the validity of the model. I tend to think of these as the intrinsic characteristics of the model strictly linked to the validation process. And you can see that there are five of those. But in addition to that, we have what I think of as extrinsic characteristics, and they're more to do with the context of use and the implementation of the model. And that very much influences the level of confidence as well. It's important to note that the five characteristics for establishing model validity, out of those, four of them can be assessed without any reference to in vivo toxicokinetic data. And only one of those sets of considerations, goodness of fit and predictivity, would require some in vivo toxicokinetic data, either for the chemical of interest or for an analog, as you just heard, via the read across approach. So this assessment framework really provides the basis for the dialogue between the developer of the model or the proponents of a model and a regulatory assessment and the assessor, the regulator, who has to make decisions based on the use of that model. And it's underpinned by two tools, the reporting template, which is completed by the model developer or the proponents of the model, and the evaluation checklist, which is intended to support the assessor uh, in concluding on the utility of the model. So next slide, please. Now, you can also think of the validity of the PBK model in terms of its component parts and the uncertainties that are associated with those component parts. So we can think of a model as being composed of the model structure, so that reflects the anatomy, the biology of, of uh, the organism of interest. There's a set of model parameters, um, as you heard um, from Ian earlier, and a set of mathematical equations. 
So there are uncertainties linked with all of these components. And it's essentially the way in which uncertainties propagate through the model that determines the overall uncertainty in the output of the model. So the reliability of prediction. Now this uh, slide also um, gives you another way of thinking about the validity of PPK models. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with um, the traditional OECD definition of validation from guidance document 34, uh, where validation is defined as the assessment of the reliability and the relevance of a method or a model for a particular purpose. You can think of some of these attributes, the ones in green, as related to reliability. And you can think of those attributes at the bottom of the slide in blue that are linked uh, to the relevance of the model. So reliability and relevance are the two main strands of model validity. Next slide, please. Of course, ultimately, it doesn't matter if the modeler thinks uh, they have a wonderful model. It is the assessor who decides whether or not a given model is fit for purpose. And that depends also on the contextual factors I mentioned before. So in a sense, to make it this judgment call, the assessor has to carry out a kind of weight of evidence. Uh, and this guidance document does not codify how that weight of evidence should be done. Um, because that is very context specific, it's very much linked to the decision making context. But we do provide this confidence matrix to help the assessor think through the weight of evidence. And you can see that it's essentially based upon three main characteristics. Um, how sound is the biological basis of the model? How well does the model simulate actual uh, toxicokinetic data, either for the chemical of interest or for an analog? And what is the uncertainty in the parameters? And how does that translate into the uncertainty in the prediction through uh, considerations of the sensitivity of the model? Now, this confidence matrix is not new actually, but it is um, a modified version of the confidence matrix that was established in the World Health Organization guidance that we heard about earlier. And next slide, please. So at this point, I will hand over to Cecilia, who will go into some more detail about the different uh, reporting standards that we developed in this guidance document. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so this is the last part of our presentation introduction to the new OECD guidance. So I'm going to cover now the last two sections in the guidance document the reporting template, and then also the evaluation checklist. Next, please. Next. So the reporting template. Um, again, like I mentioned earlier, harmonizing a reporting template can um, reduce the burden of preparing different reports for different countries or for different agencies on the same analysis. Um, at the same time, consistent reporting can also reduce the burden for reviewers. When needed, customized changes can be made to meet specific needs. And as I mentioned in the, at the beginning, the template in the OECD guidance is similar to those published um, in the WHO guidance, um, the FDA, and then also EMA um, reporting template guidance. Next, please. So these are uh, what we propose to include in a reporting um, when you are trying when you are reporting a PBP, PBK uh, modeling analysis. Uh, what we recommend is starting by identifying the name of the model, some details about the modeler, um, have an ex executive summary, then providing details about the model and key uncertainties related to the model then the implementation of the model and any peer review records, parameter tables, and of course, uh, references and background information. And I will talk more about the two highlighted sections, um, model characterization, and then also the uncertainty. Next, please. So for model characterization, uh, we recommend including details to cover the five steps in the modeling workflow. Um, as I presented earlier, the first step is problem formulation. So the scope and purpose of developing this model. 
extend uh, model conceptualization, including the structure and the mathematical equation. Uh, the third is model parameterization, um, including how you estimate parameters or how you use um, calculation to get um, to certain values uh, for your parameters. Then the computer implementation, uh, also providing details on how to run the model. And finally, um, the model performance. Next, please. And uh, for uncertainties in the report, identify any uncertainty related to the model structure, the parameters, and how they impact model outputs, and any other uncertainties related to the model. Next, please. Okay, uh, the checklist for evaluation uh, next. In this OECD guidance, we provide a checklist for the model users to analyze the info information that are provided by the modelers. The checklist has um, different questions to ask, but it does not have a weighing system to tell the user which element is more important. The weight assigned to each element should be determined by the user, and then also it should be based on the context and purpose of the model. The checklist can be separated into two parts. The first half is about the context in implementation of the model, and then the second half focused on the assessment of model validity. Next, please. So this is the first half of the context and implementation. So here are some of the questions that uh, you can ask. Um, the purpose determines the acceptable degree of confidence. Um, so if in the case when it is hard to determine the acceptable degree of confidence, what you can do is think about um, if the uncertainty level is larger with, with a model or without a model. Uh, for example, one of the applications that we mentioned earlier is um, converting in vitro concentration to an external concentration. And uh, do you, uh, even with um, large uncertainty um, in the PBK model, um, the, the uncertainty is probably less than without using a PBK model to do that um, in vitro to in vivo extrapolation. And for documentation, is uh, the model documented with enough details? And uh, for software implementation and verification, are there any errors with the model equations or code implementation? And has the model been reviewed by other parties or is additional review required? Next, please. Um, and this is um, what I have uh, discovered, the peer review engagement. Uh, next. Uh, for the second half of the checklist, questions can be asked about the biological basis of the model, the model equations, parameters, uncertainty, and sensitivity analysis. And finally, the goodness of fit and predictability uh, may be evaluated if in vivo data are available for the chemical or uh, for an analog uh, using the read across approach. Um, and this concludes our introduction to the new OECD guidance. And we will now begin our first Q&A session. Okay, well, thank you to everybody for the uh, first set of presentations. We have some good questions uh, that have been coming through the chat. Um, I will start at the beginning, so it, it flows uh, in, in the order of presentations. There's a question about the physical chemical parameters um, and whether they're measured at a certain temperature um, and whether the software predicts those um, parameters at the same temperature and whether that actually makes a difference in, in the output of the model. So uh, what is the importance of determining, say, a physical property at 37 degrees Celsius versus some other um, uh, temperature? Um, yeah, so I, I can take yeah. that. So for the physicochemical parameters, I guess usually they're, they're measured at room temperature. 
you can make corrections for differences, for instance, in log P or log KOW between uh, say 25 or 20 and, and 37 degrees. But uh, certainly for lipophilicity, then the difference you get from the change in temperature is probably within the error of me measurement anyway. And so generally it's not really, I would say most people don't correct it, but you, you can correct for differences in temperature. I think most people use data that's measured at 25 degrees or, or room temperature for the physiochemical data. Obviously for the biochemical data, that's usually measured at 37 degrees. Okay, thanks Ian. Um, so there's a question which was prompted um, by Marina's presentation on the, uh, the least squares analysis uh, model fitting um, about the nature of the data that um, is being uh, inputted into the model. Do PBK models only involve quantitative continuous variables as opposed to say categorical variables? Uh, and if, if you have a mix of the two, how can you handle that? So Marina, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I'm trying to understand the question. Uh, continuous variables. Uh, Physiological parameters are quite important in the description or an inclusion of PPK models. And typically they are not considered continuous variables in the sense that they're measured under certain conditions, uh, say cardiac output, flow, flow rates, uh, even solubility coefficients, partition coefficients are measured under certain conditions. So I would consider them discrete values in the sense that they are uh, bound by certain uh, uh, experimental conditions. I, I'm not sure that I answered the question. But, um, um, would any of the other panelists like to um, add to that? Okay, I'm not seeing any responses. So I will, uh, in the interest of time, move on to some of the other questions. There were quite a few questions um, about the difference between local sensitivity analysis and global sensitivity analysis. Which one is better? Uh, and under which circumstances would one be more appropriate than the other? Um, so I, I, guess that's, um, I guess that's for you, Marina, and for George. Right. Uh, George, may I, may I go first? Please do. Um, I, I have concentrated on local analysis because my goal has usually been to ensure that I have unique answers to the parameters I'm trying to estimate. I'm getting, uh, or I'm using regressions and optimization to determine unknown uh, parameters for these models and the data that I've generated. Um, and at the time, I've been doing this since 1993, at the time, simply the global sensitivity analysis techniques were not as developed as they are now. And so we have uh, George and other colleagues to thank for that. But I think it's still useful to do a local analysis if we have a new type of PBK, PBK approach, because then uh, we can ensure that we have um, parameters and can have unique values um, and also can help us rank the parameters. Now, global sensitivity analysis can do that too, but there is a computational cost and I will let, I, I will please let George expand on that. Okay. Um, yes, uh, <clears throat> I'm not an expert, I have, colleagues who are experts in global sensitivity analysis um, and I will transmit to you what I've heard from them. Um, global sensitivity analysis is far more computationally expensive than local sensitivity analysis and you do it uh, and expect that a simulation can take a good few hours to complete but its advantage is that it can cope with the different non-linear biological mechanisms you may have captured in your model. And you may wish to um, exercise your model across a range, uh, quite a range of exposure concentrations uh, 
Um, and, and that is why it's uh, most appropriate for this type of um, PVPK model. Okay, thank you both. Um, another quite technical question um, to do with the nature of the chemical of interest. Um, what about the chemical complexity of, of the substance you're modeling, i.e. The, the number and type of organic functional groups? How would that potentially impact the comfort level of the outcome of a PPK model? Uh, so I guess anything other than simple organics, um, complex organics, mixtures, uh, nanomaterials, any, any reactions to that? Well, I would like to give an example um, on how PBK models can include different routes of exposure and uh, account, say, for nanomaterials for the inhalation route. And some of the modeling allows us to estimate deposition rates in different components of the uh, respiratory tree. Um, that is an example of an application of this type of model that can help us get uh, accurate estimates of absorption in the lung, for example. Um, it, it, really, it, it really depends not just on the chemical properties, but also on the exposure route that you are considering. So you can take into account uh, absorption factors and chemical properties of the chemical. And the inhalation route is just an example. Okay, so the, the, the source of exposure is also an important consideration, not just the the nature of the chemical itself. Um, in the interest of time, I'll pick one more question that's been asked in various ways by various people, and that's to do with the acceptance of PBK models. Um, uh, is there an issue with um, proprietary models and open source versus closed uh, codes? So I don't know, maybe Cecilia, would, would you like to take that one? Um, yes. Um... So for different agency and for different countries, I think the answer will, will, will vary. Um, as I know that US Food and Drug Administration, they do accept uh, proprietary PBK models, but for US EPA, uh, we, we don't uh, for various of reasons because uh, most of our data and modeling results, re results have to be um, uh, publicly available and uh, we cannot make proprietary modeling uh, software and equations available to the public. So that is why we cannot use it. Um, however, we can use, um, potentially use proprietary software for exploratory work. So uh, not making re uh, regulatory decision, but uh, it, it can be a very helpful research tool. Okay, thank you. So transparency and traceability uh, are key considerations. Um, so at this stage, I think we should move on with the next part of the presentation. Um, so I will hand over to Alicia, who will uh, sure. present the case study. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, now uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, briefly uh, the um, uh, uh, Annex uh, 4, which is actually a document that comes together with the guidance document. And um, next slide, please. Uh, so first I would like to give a bit of uh, context. So um, PBK models, we know that have been applied uh, uh, to better characterize interspecies and intraspecies variation in kinetics. They also were used to support uh, extrapolations from high uh, to low doses and root to root extrapolation. Um, we, um, we also, we have now uh, shifted, uh, uh, no, sorry, um, yeah, we are now shifted more towards uh, a use of uh, PBK models uh, using alternative data, where we actually are trying to convert in, intra, uh, in vitro concentrations uh, to uh, corresponding in vivo external dose. So we try to assess in vitro point of departure. This, um, uh, this approach is called quantitative in vitro to in vivo extrapolation. 
We have now you know that PBK models are more and more used within an IATA uh, framework. So they can be used to better identify and to better fill in gaps uh, uh, and allow um, uh, extrapolation from existing toxicity data to inform not only the risk assessment, but also uh, inform and refine testing needs. As I mentioned before, PBK models now can be used and help in uh, uh, gaps, uh, identifying gaps for poor uh, data poor chemicals. And finally, I would like to uh, uh, show you that uh, uh, in, uh, in um, the guidance document, we have a, a, a table where you can find information on how you can build the PBK models, how PBK models can be applied. And we have selected a few examples where PBK models simulation have been used in the risk assessment context from US EPA, EFSA, and EMA. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, now I would like to uh, uh, give you uh, the overview. So, and I would also take the opportunity to thank the uh, almost 50 people that were working on this guidance document and also had uh, the will to push forward case studies to allow uh, the reader to understand how to use the guidance document. Uh, if you go to the link that is on the bottom left, uh, you will arrive uh, uh, to the web page of the OECD where you have all the publications on testing and assessment. The guidance document uh, has number 331. And if you see at the end where there is this arrow on the top, you can see that you can have a link to the Annex 4. So it's there where you could find all the 13 case studies that are listed in this slide. So we have a, a, a case study that have been pushed forward by EFSA. So case study one, two, and 13. And then there are other case studies that are uh, here on, on the right that are more based on already available publications that the uh, people involved in this effort uh, pushed forward in order to uh, allow us to use the evaluation toolkit, let's call it, the reporting template, the checklist, and the evaluation matrix to evaluate their PBK models. Uh, now I would like to go into two case studies, case study eight and nine. Next slide, please. Where we have used, uh, uh, um, uh, where the same uh, PBK model has been used uh, to inform two different uh, uh, scopes. And we had two different proper formulation. The CAS study was built for caffeine and, the, and its uh, uh, metabolite. Uh, next slide, please. And in order to give you a bit of context on why this model was developed, I will give you a bit of background. Uh, we all know that the human health risk of exposure to a chemical can be characterized by risk characterization uh, ratio approach where the human exposure level is compared uh, to a pre-established human limit value. And this value is usually based on an animal point of departure, which is divided by the relevant assessment uh, uh, factors, uh, uncertainty factors. Or we can use the so-called margin of exposure, which is actually the ratio of a point of departure based on a NOEL or a BMDL to its theoretical or, or, or predicted or estimated human intake dose. However, due to a shortcoming in both approaches uh, in uh, the apparent lack of, uh, of uh, species and route dependent ADME information, um, the, um, there has been um, created by actually published by Bessem et al. Uh, the so-called margin of internal exposure where we have the same approach as the margin of, of external exposure, but we use PBK models to account for the kinetic of species under studies. And so we go, we take into account biokinetics information. In this case studies, we have used caffeine, which was chosen because we had, it's, uh, we had two route of exposure. Uh, we had information for uh, two different species. Uh, and is also known to be part of our food. Everybody, um, almost everybody drinks coffee and uh, uh, is also part in cosmetics because it's used as ingredient uh, due to, to the property of uh, helping uh, to avoid wrinkles. Um, we have uh, information in the literature and the, the, uh, a rat PBK model was developed for caffeine to convert the chosen oral NOEL 
for uh, we, to the internal uh, dose metric, which was uh, now an AUC or a CMAX for the caffeine, as well as for the metabolite para paraxantine. Uh, we then uh, also developed an oral human PBK model that we that was uh, uh, um, actually calibrated using the oral intake was calibrated using uh, uh, human volunteer studies, and after this was calibrated, we added a dermal compartment to accommodate also the topical use of the cosmetic product. So caffeine intake from oral and topical use from cosmetic product of, of caffeine. The dermal model was actually calibrated using QSARs to, to simulate uh, human uh, dermal penetration. And this resulted in those metrics of AUC and CM uh, and CMAX for both the red oral, as you can see in the bottom uh, right graph, and CMAX, and also for the, uh, sorry, for the oral and the human dermal uh, uh, models. And these were then compared in resulting margin of internal exposure. Um, we, this is just an overview of the approach and why this was built. Uh, and now we wanted to take this uh, paper and evaluate the model that was proposed for this uh, scope. Next slide, please. So to evaluate the models, we have used the, the, the reporting template first. Uh, we can see that the model was described in a very specific and was built in very specific details. As you can see on the uh, right side, we can have the uh, uh, two uh, route of uh, exposure, oral versus dermal. And you can see that the dermal description was so specific, even hair follicles have been put inside the model and was very, very highly parameterized. We reported all the information that were existing, both in the Bessem paper, as well as in the main paper where the model was developed, Kajewska et al. From, um, and we uh, 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 filled in the, the report, uh, so the template. Uh, we reported the, that the equation were available, the assumption, the, both of the model and the biological information. And we also looked at the information that how the model was parameterized. Model was parameterized mainly by using uh, um, literature data. And uh, also some of the part of the model were calibrated using in vivo data. Um, next slide, please. All this information then were assessed uh, by using the checklist. So we took, we had the report on one hand and we had the checklist and we went through the checklist and understood if the information retrieved from this, this uh, published paper were sufficient enough to evaluate and to be able to use the model in uh, the risk assessment context. We had, uh, so one of the uh, uh, drawbacks was the model code was not available, was not uh, published uh, uh, with the papers while the equation were there. So we had to request the authors the code in order to be able to run and to see if the, uh, the, the model run accordingly. We uh, were able to report all the assumptions and uncertainties are reported by the authors. And also the input parameters that were taken, were taken from the literature. And we were not very sure on how to score this in terms of quality of the input parameters. Uh, a local sensitivity analysis was performed and uh, uh, also a Monte Carlo uh, to see the variation within the population. Satterbolt kinetics were available by means of VMAX and KM, and this was included and were explained. Uh, next slide, please. The, once we had the two uh, template field in check, uh, the checklist was uh, finalized, we were able to use the overall evaluation metrics in order to us to make a final conclusion. So uh, as, a, um, as we can see, there is a, uh, um, we have a kind of medium confidence in the use of this uh, model uh, because there is a, uh, some of the information like the biological basis and some of the parameters that are uh, used to parameterize the model are questionable in the meaning that we don't know the quality. However, the model reproduced uh, the, the shape uh, of the, of, and the time curve profile of the chemical of interest when we were testing it. And uh, we, so, we, we saw that the local sensitivity analysis could be applied and could be used. 
So we can evaluate, we, we scored as a medium of confidence. And this, uh, next slide, please, gave us a final uh, conclusion where we recommended that the PBK model and the relative output can be used in a regulatory framework only as supportive information. So it can help, but not the actual value uh, uh, should be used. So it's just informative. Next slide. Well, in the second uh, example, so in case study nine, we have Cosmetic Europe, which, uh, pro, um, which is based on the Cosmetic Europe work uh, where uh, Anayata was created and where the PBK model from Gaevskaito was used, was extensively uh, facelift, let's say, simplified, recorded in Berkeley Madonna. So it was a different uh, programming language. And uh, uh, in order to uh, be sure about the input parameters, some of the data were uh, remeasured in vitro or rerun in, in silico. And here you can see that the, 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 the schematic representation of the PBM model is much more simplified uh, without all the details, for instance, about the uh, dermal uh, penetration within the hair follicles. So uh, we did the same exercise as explained before, reporting a template, checklist, and this made us understand that with uh, higher confidence in the model parameters, we can gain a shift to the left from the middle to the left of our model. The model, of course, reproduced the kinetic data, so there were no model errors in the simulation. And we had still a local sensitivity analysis, so we could score a reasonable, give a reasonable confidence. Next slide, please. In conclusion, here we could actually give a little bit more. So we could say that the PBK model developed for this uh, uh, case study for this uh, specific question, so cross-species extrapolation, is a reasonable approach for a preliminary hazard characterization. We also highlighted that if we would have a global sensitivity analysis, this would have given more a global overview of the key parameters that perturbs the model and would have gained much more trust in the, uh, in the model prediction. Uh, next slide, please. So now I believe that the main difference uh, between the two case studies is actually that one was built more to answer a scientific question, of course, with in mind the goal of uh, going for, uh, in, for an approach for risk assessment, while the other one was, the second one was really part of an integrated work. So it's a piece of a puzzle that was going to be put within a risk assessment to answer risk assessment questions. Uh, this is uh, uh, the final uh, slide that uh, I'm going to share with you, and I just would like to make uh, one last uh, uh, remark. If you are interested and if you have a PBK model that you would like to evaluate with this toolkit, let's say, please email us, uh, myself or the OECD Secretariat, and we can try to populate uh, 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 and extend the Annex 4 that is now available with new example, uh, with different questions. And this would be very, very uh, interesting in order to harmonize also the reporting of, the, of, of, of these models. And also we encourage, if you are an IATA submitter uh, through the OECD IATA case study project to use the guidance document that we have now today uh, show to you and presented to you, uh, and to incorporate uh, uh, um, this when you are using a PBK model analysis in the case study. Uh, with this, I would like to thank you all for the uh, time you spent today uh, listening to us. And I would like to give back the floor to Magda for the last part, the uh, last half an hour session, Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. That's great. Um, and uh, here we are concluded with all our presentations. So I encourage you to submit uh, our questions in the uh, Q&A box. Uh, I, I can see there is uh, one question for you, Alicia, uh, for the caffeine case study. Um, that was found to be very interesting and that was done for a chemical with lots of data, including multi-species PK data. Can you please explain if the work with the cosmetic, uh, Cosmetics Europe included the in vivo PK data still? 
uh, do you think a similar result would be obtained if uh, a bottom-up approach was done as described in the OECD guidance document? Um, so if I, if I remember correctly, it was reparametrized using the in vitro information. However, um, for um, the, the, the Gaevska et al. model, we used the, the in vivo data were uh, also used. So I think it's a bit still a mix. Uh, and I believe that uh, if we would be able to parameterize more and more uh, these models using the in vitro data without the use of animals or to shift towards a more uh, uh, um, human approach uh, so where uh, also here you can use the in vitro information uh, and then you can calibrate uh, based on your 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 uh, or you can validate based on your in vivo if available uh, information uh, it, it's it's possible and and yeah and i think it's it's very relevant uh, uh, for this guidance document to to actually help and uh, illustrate uh, uh, how um, um, information that are not uh, uh, typically used uh, in uh, validation context or evaluation context of the PBK model can be applied. So indeed, I, um, it yeah, would be great if uh, uh, more uh, models are developed using these alternative approaches than, than in vivo data. Okay, thank you, Alicia. Uh, maybe I will uh, take the opportunity to ask all the, our panelists to to join, uh, switch on the cameras, yeah, and sorry. take the the remaining uh, um, questions. So I have a question uh, about the validation of uh, the PBK model. How many uh, drugs or and uh, dosage? Will be essential to be acceptable, so so the model can be acceptable by by regulators. So that's uh, the know if. <laughs> so with, um, well, first of all, this guidance does not specifically talk about drugs, pharmaceuticals, um, because that's dealt with by other guidance from the FDA and the European Medicines Agency. Um, but I think it, it's a good question in the sense that. How many chemicals do you need to, to calibrate and validate a PBK model? Um, and what are the ranges and concentrations that you need to test? Um, so I think at one extreme, it could just be a single chemical, um, a model for a single chemical. At the other extreme, it could be a more generic PBK model. So it could be a whole family of congeneric chemicals. Uh, and of course, yes, a range of uh, doses, uh, concentrations, obviously adds to the robustness. Um, what we're looking for is to have the best possible coverage of concentration space and the time space. So I think um, I can't give a sort of absolute answer, but the more information you have, the better, I would say. Okay, thank you, Andrew. I don't know if there is anything, anybody wants to add anything else? Okay, so we move to our next question that is also um again about uh, data and and um, asking for an example of where pbk data have been accepted by regulatory agencies um, i can i can give an example for uh, tce and pbk pbk modeling for um, inhalation and um, other routes, IV, for example. And that guy, that document was published in 2011. Uh, it can be found at the EPA site website, uh, but it, it is, and uh, the publications are also available uh, separate in, the, in addition to the document. But it is an example of how data um, was used and integrated with PBK modeling for a risk assessment. And I'm wondering if this question is uh, related to PBK model in general or, or the type of model we are talking about today, which is not 
calibrated or evaluated with in vivo data. Um, so the example that Marina provided is uh, a case where animal in vivo data are available to uh, test the model performance before um, scaling up to humans. And um, in the um, Office of Pesticide Programs at the EPA, we have um, several examples where PVCK models are used for interspecies extrapolation, intraspecies extrapolation, route-to-route -route extrapolation, life stage extrapolation, and then also a read-across approach um, to uh, look at the age sensitivity for an entire class of pesticides. But in, the, in all of these um, examples, animal in vivo data are available. So you can test the model to have um, enough confidence in your PBK models before you use it um, to do the extrapolation. Um, so um, if this question is related to the type of uh, models that we're talking about, um, the, the type of model that do not have any in vivo data for calibration or evaluation, then um, I do not have an example of using PBK model for um, say registration of pesticides. But I do have one example where we use um, this type of model for um, well, exploratory purpose. Um, so in this example, we, we are looking for a class of chemicals, organophosphates. And we're trying to compare the point of departure that you got from the traditional um, animal studies, which is choline esterase inhibition. So uh, from choline esterase inhibition, you have um, this um, noels or um, some threshold where say 10% um, choline esterase inhibition. So you have animal point of departure. And then uh, we compare it with um, the point of departure estimated using in vitro um, DNT assays. So we take the, uh, we took the AC50s from different in vitro assays using a PBK model, in this case, the EPA HTTK um, model to convert an in vitro concentration AC50 to an in vivo point of departure. So this would be um, in vitro based point of departure and then compare with the more traditional in vivo based point of departure. And then also the endpoints are different. One is choline esterase inhibition and then the other one is uh, DNT assay based. So um, this comparison um, help us understand whether or not our current um, risk assessment is um, protective of DNT um, uh, effects. So this is one example where we are not using PBK model to derive, for example, a human safe um, level, but we are using um, uh, in vitro based PBK model to, um, for, for comparison. Yeah, if I could just comment on that as well. I think in the pharmaceutical field, particularly in drug interactions, that there are a number of um, regulatory examples where PBPK models have been used. I mean, typically in those, you've got some human data for uh, verification, but um, there are still kind of untested scenarios that are being uh, used in, in those kind of examples. So within the pharmaceutical field, there are lots of examples of using PBPK models um, and not necessarily all all with um, identical data for the scenarios that are being uh, approved. Okay, thank you Ian, thank you Cecilia and uh, Marina. So I see one more question. Um, yeah, he's referring to Alicia's presentation uh, where she called uh, attention to the confidence of model parameters uh, and um, there is a wish to reinforce this concern. Uh, so it was found that uh, several dermal um, permeation KP, KP values reported in the bibliography were uh, implausible. 
Uh, and the question is uh, to our panelists, is there any standard method that evaluates the validity of parameter values to be incorporated in uh, the PBK models? So I can start and maybe uh, the others can uh, <laughs> fill in gaps if I, and I believe uh, for uh, indeed there are uh, test uh, guideline, uh, guidelines at the OECD, which allows you to uh, make a better you um, follow uh, principles and in a better way produce uh, uh, input, uh, data and measurements. And this could be considered uh, uh, of higher confidence to uh, respect to a parameter uh, that is lacking uh, such a TG testing uh, uh, guideline. Um, the thing is that there are few uh, test guidelines available for uh, uh, biokinetics uh, parameterization or for measurements of biokinetics uh, because it's a bit, uh, um, yeah, there is still a, a lot of uh, discussion ongoing to, towards, uh, uh, there are some available for fish, so to for hep, hep, um, hepatocytes uh, um, in fish measurements uh, for clearance, uh, however, if you don't have uh, any uh, specific uh, TG available, you could use uh, at least good modeling, a uh, good measurement practice or good laboratory practice by following uh, the guidance uh, uh, guidance document, I think it is, or um, which is called GiveImp, and also gives you, if you don't have a test method that is standardized, uh, it gives you steps on how you could uh, um, better uh, inform your analysis and measurement. Uh, with this, maybe I leave the floor to somebody else who, of the panelists that would like to give a bit more uh, input. I would just add that, as we heard before, not all parameters are equal. Um, some influence the output more than others. So you could look at sensitivity analysis to see you know, how worried you should be um, about the variability about a given input parameter. Uh, and of course you can simulate a range of uh, values um, around a sort of central value of that parameter. I can just add, I think in general also, you'd want to be using values that you could justify and, and support. Um, so if, if the model is using parameters that are, are not feasible, then and in my view, it wouldn't be a good model. Okay, thank you, Ian, Andrew, and Alicia. Uh, it's uh, one question that uh, I think we answered uh, in written, but I think uh, maybe it's good to reinforce uh, some of the elements of this guidance. And uh, I would like to, to see your views. So why do we have to consider data scarce use cases and conduct elaborate sensitivity analysis? Uh, with uh, likely huge confidence intervals? Uh, couldn't regulators just request sufficient data, um, in vitro data also, uh, such that every case is well informed? So I can maybe start. I think, I think in, so in terms of the input parameters, um, you know, that there are different um, techniques that you could use to generate the, in, the input parameters to, to uh, a PPPK model, and those um, obviously could be requested. I think what we were really thinking about with the guidance was the scenarios where, um, unlike in, say, the pharmaceutical uh, arena, where, where there isn't any or very limited in vivo exposure data in humans to compare the model to, and what would you do in those situations? So, and I, I think obviously in, you know, if you're looking at um, some of the chemical space and, and some of the different sectors, then it's not always possible to go away and, and generate all the data that you might ideally uh, like to have. And I think those are the kind of scenarios that we're trying to address with the guidance. Yeah, I mean, this, this goes to the context of use um, again. Um, what is the regulatory framework? What are the options for 
for requesting new data? What is the urgency of the decision? And what are the consequences of being wrong? So all of those things have to be weighed up in a way by the assessor uh, and they would use whatever options they have or, or don't have at uh, their disposal. So it's, it's hard to give a single answer, but it's it's very, very heterogeneous situation. Yeah, exactly. And uh, in this guidance, we'll try to cover, you know, the uh, all the possible uh, scenarios. So, and uh, maybe to also mention here that uh, we have at the OECD this IATA case study project, where um, we'll encourage from now on to also uh, include uh, a PBK models uh, using uh, um, using uh, in vitro data and also. Uh, applying this guidance, what we have uh, in this guidance. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that more uh, examples will come and will cover uh, different uh, regulatory scenarios. Um, I don't know if you want to mention anything. I think we have already a couple of, of cases uh, um, in the project, but for sure more, more will come. I don't know if there is any uh, any input on that. If uh, if you're aware of something, or if uh, about how even to 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 use this uh, this guidance in, in IATA um, in the context of of IATA. So maybe it's the, worth after explaining how people could propose an IATA case study under the OECD. What is the procedure for that? Who would they contact? Okay, so uh, they should contact the OECD secretariat, uh, um, and uh, it's not me directly, but uh, yeah, through our general account, uh, and uh, you can um, receive this general email. We can point you to to the to the right person. Um, and uh, yes, there is actually uh, lots of interest because so uh, this is uh, we could say a new tool that integrates different elements, different information uh, sources, and uh, this uh, uh, project is aiming basically uh, to gain experience uh, through these uh, new tools and build confidence. So I, I can, oops. yeah, I think there was one more question, but was answered in written. So I don't know if there are any, any additional remarks from, from the panelists or Maybe it, it was good uh, that uh, Andrew showed us this confidence matrix, and maybe a question would be how many levels of confidence can be derived from this matrix that uh, you showed us, Andrew? Uh, good question. Um, well, there are nine boxes in that matrix, so you've got, I don't know how many combinations of uh, those boxes, um, but we haven't um, codified this. Um, in any way, because I think we can't codify it, not at this stage. I mean, it's a weight of evidence and, and how the assessor weighs the evidence uh, is very much up to the assessor and the context of use again. Um, what Alicia showed in some of the case studies was an attempt to kind of translate that weight of evidence into a level of confidence, like medium confidence or standard confidence or whatever, but that's not actually in the guidance document. I mean, Maybe that's something for a future update, but we haven't covered that explicitly here. I completely agree with Andrew. Um, I, in my personal personal opinion, I don't think that is something that a guidance document can provide. How do you assign confidence? Um, even in the case where in vivo data are available, if you look at the previous TVPK guidance documents. Um, either the WHO or EPA, um, 
um, if you look at the confidence matrix, you'll see that um, you will have high confidence if your model can predict human data, but in most cases, we don't have human data. And um, for low confidence is when your model cannot even reproduce uh, or uh, predict available animal data. In that case, you probably wouldn't even submit your model because your model doesn't even work. So the median confidence is when you can somehow predict animal data, but you don't have human data to compare. But in most cases, that's what we are. We are not, we don't have a perfect model uh, that has human model, human data to compare to. We, we, we are not going to submit a model that doesn't work. So most of the time we are in that middle zone. So it really depends on uh, what is the purpose of the model, uh, what kind of evidence you can put together, uh, like Andrew was saying, weight of evidence, uh, you put everything together to, um, to, to, e to evaluate your, your confidence level uh, with the model. And I think it's even more challenging in the case where we are relying on in vitro and in silico approaches to develop a model and uh, we can't really test the model with um, available in vivo data, oh, well, with in vivo data, there's no available in vivo data. And if I may add uh, just a, a practical example, when we received the, the case studies from our uh, group working group, uh, in, in, in one example, uh, uh, let's say that I sent it back because when I was making the checklist, I found that there was not sufficient uh, uh, evidence and it would have scored all low uh, because uh, there were not in sufficient information to score it higher. Uh, so also in the workflow that we have gone through today, you see that there is some exit and arrows that allow you to restart from step two if you can reinform and reinforce your model. So in the case study presented in the Annex 4, you will see that there are no um, actually low scoring uh, uh, case studies. All of them are either in the middle or higher, but this is because it was an interaction, it was really an interactive discussion among the submitters of the, of the, of the models that was, were evaluated. But it also showed that it was, um, it was interesting in the way that people reported their information. So we really needed yeah, to adapt this. And it, and it so, also shows that it's, it was a useful process. Thank you. Okay, so I can see some more some more questions here. Uh, so in the context of our next uh, generation Rita, uh, Rita Cross uh, risk assessment, sorry, what kind of uh, uncertainty factor uh, should be implemented on the PBK predictions to be um, conservative or what kind of considerations should be made? Uh, that's a difficult question too. Um, that really goes to the use of a model in a decision-making context, which is outside of the scope of this guidance. Um, from what I've seen, the case studies that have been developed either in the IATA case studies program or uh, in, in the context of the APCRA initiative, for example, that's the, the interagency initiative where they're exploring the utility of new approach methods. Um, when you do reverse dosimetry from, in, say, in vitro toxicity data, and you compare that with external exposures for a large number of chemicals, it tends to be conservative anyway. So it may well be you don't actually need to apply um, an uncertainty factor. But again, this is a question for best practices. It's a, a question for how to actually use PPK models in a decision-making context. And what we have at the moment in this guidance does not cover that, doesn't actually give you a specific answer to that question. Yes, again, I think it's something that we need to build experience on that and maybe we'll be able to, <laughs> to provide further, further guidance. So thank you, Andrew. And um, so there is a question about the um, top-down uh, PBK modeling. Uh, um, how how accurate should we expect the models to be? In the past, it was twofold when doing uh, uh, this uh, top-down uh, PBK modeling, or is this still reasonable criteria? Uh, 
So I, we really didn't uh, uh, go into this, uh, uh, how much fold difference uh, we would need. But of course, this uh, two fold has been uh, and has been uh, our, um, has an, yeah, we have kept this as a as a as example, um, so we didn't refine this. And I think we have discussed it in our. We had met only once the whole group to discuss this in Paris at the OECD. Uh, however, uh, we really didn't go into detail uh, about uh, the twofold um, um, fold difference in, uh, in in the in the simulations. Um, what I feel is that I think this uh, is still um, a reasonable, um, um, how do you say, window uh, for the predictions. But maybe the other panelists have uh, can add more. Yeah, from so from my perspective, I think that twofold is a reasonable thing to aim for if you've got all of your in vitro. Um, systems properly calibrated. I don't think it's unreasonable that you would be able to get that level of accuracy. Um, but I think one of the problems with recommending a success criteria is partly it depends on what you want to do with the, the model and what your uh, context of use is. Um, so for many cases, twofold would be uh, good enough. For other cases, it might not be. So that's I think that's one of the reasons why putting a hard like criteria on whether a model is acceptable is, is tricky and why people tend not to do it. Okay, thank you, Ian and Alicia. Yeah, there is probably this will be our last question. So could the panel comment on the use of uh, PBK models as a protective tool for kinetic prediction that is physiologically based in the absence of any in vivo data, human or animal? Presumably this would score low across the confidence matrix in the guidance, but isn't uh, this still useful? I think it would be useful to the extent that you could rank chemicals according to the level of concern and maybe then you could take relative decisions on that basis. Um, but you wouldn't actually know, would you, whether your PBK model was accurate, conservative, over conservative or not. Um, but that said, how often do you know that from an animal study, you know, compared with with uh, effects in humans, you know, you you have an approach, you apply it consistently, and uh, you hope that that provides um, safety and consistency in, in decision making. And also, in some cases, you do need a PDK model. Again, going back to that in vitro to in vivo extrapolation in order for you to estimate an external concentration based on some in vitro concentration, you do need a PBK model, even though there is uncertainty with the model, but without it, the uncertainty is even bigger. You don't even know how to um, convert it uh, from an internal concentration to an external concentration. And following up on Cecilia's uh, comment, uh, that's where I think classes or grouping classes of chemicals uh, or similar chemicals would be important. We may not have data for the chemical in question, but we may have data for a similar compound, like the organophosphates example Cecilia gave. So I think uh, we are very close to, to the end of uh, this uh, our uh, webinar, uh, there is one more question I will try to, to reply in, um, in, uh, in writing. And uh, so 
Well, first of all, thank you very much for your participation and the questions that uh, enables to to better uh, address some of the elements of this uh, guidance uh, document. Of course, an enormous thank to our experts, not only for presenting today and answering your questions, but also for their contribution in the development of, uh, of this uh, guidance. Uh, also, many thanks to our assistants and technical staff for helping us to have this very uh, smooth running uh, webinar. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you. As we, we, we indicated, this recording will be made uh, available soon on our web page. And the slides also uh, can be made available for downloading through the same uh, link. So thank you very, very much and uh, have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye.